out and for those who maybe haven't had the opportunity to view it tonight we can share it with them then as well um so with that said i'm going to hand you over to uh, johnny dial i'd like to welcome him to our webinar this evening uh, spoke to Johnny a couple of weeks ago and he kindly agreed to, to deliver on this topic. I know it's one he feels passionate about. Um, for those of you, I think it is that everyone to know who, who Johnny Dial is. Um, and what I'm delighted to say is one of our staff members in Kildare, he works with Leinster GA and Kildare GA, so he's a great asset to us um, from a games development staff. And I'd just like to welcome Johnny and hopefully you'll all pick up a lot from this evening. So I'll pass it over to yourself, Johnny. Thanks, Colin. Um that's a lovely introduction, fair play to you. Um, just, yeah, I was, I was coming down in the car and I was a bit nervous and, and uh, because if you're all in front of me and we had a chat, it'd be great, you know, because your experiences and my experience and sometimes this can, this can feel a little bit a little bit weird uh, because you, you're talking to yourself. Now, some people are telling me when they're at home with the kids, I feel like I am talking to myself. But anyway, here we are and I'm delighted to, delighted to be here and um, hopefully you go away and get something out, out of uh, tonight and we have a lot of material uh, to go through and you know it, it, it be anything that's that pops up along the way or any questions or answers uh, as Colin says if you write them down and we'll come back to them or put something in the box and I'll try to address them um, as I said we've, we've a good bit of good bit of material and I suppose from, from my own point of view um, you know resilience is not something I was aware of from a playing point of view, obviously as a coach, you're, you're very, very aware of it. Um, and you look back at maybe your own playing career and, and maybe different things along the way that you thought were the end of the world um, were probably the making of you in so many ways. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that um, as well. And we'll, we'll, we'll show a couple of videos and we'll put a few pictures in here and, and um, different, different ways, I suppose, of building that resilience or helping or at least identifying it in a player um, and, and how you can help. Obviously, I'm sure there's, there's coaches, there's parents, and maybe players uh, of, among you. I don't know. One or two names look familiar, um, but, you know, you're probably trying to get something yourselves out of them. Wherever, whatever, um, wherever you fit into that, regardless of um, whether it is, it's a parent, player, or, or um, a coach, hopefully we, we get something out of it. Um, so, we we'll, we'll kick on. I suppose from just from maybe a small introduction, of my own uh, background. I suppose I uh, obviously am working for, as Colin says, working for the Leinster Council as a coach. Um, something I'm very passionate about. I suppose played the game um, for for my club. Obviously, Alan Wood first, and then went on to was lucky enough to go on to represent Kildare. Um, some brilliant times, some very lean times. Um, Nearly, nearly got there, and um, did get there. Regrets and all that go with, and you know we might talk about them. But I suppose the, the big thing for me, and staying with the topic of resilience, was always the, the lessons you learned, and, and trying to bring them forward to make you a better player. Um, and and that, that for me was was the key. And I suppose the one thing I would have always learned, and maybe it came from my own environment. Obviously, my dad played for for the club for years. And he always had a great saying, he says, just be there, always be there. Um, and for a long time, I didn't really understand what, what that meant. But loads of times when, you know, I was maybe, was a sub or was a, and something happened, whether it was something I got injured or something I didn't turn up, and I was there. Now, a lot of time it was because he brought me to the field, but, you know, that was stuck to me all the time, all the way through my career. If you're there, give a chance. Um, and I cut through the gates of Alamo or Hawk, giving out about a coach, giving out about um, a manager, or, you know, wasn't picked, should have been picked, taken off. But the fact that I always tried to be there was a great was a great asset. So, you know, looking back on, on from a playing it's probably the best piece of advice I, I got from, was from my dad. It's just always be there. Whatever chance you have of playing when you're there, you, you have none when you're not there. And that's advice I would always give to, to, to players now. Um, always be there. So listen, we'll get stuck into it. As I say, hopefully we 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 we'll plenty of chats along the way. Um, so I suppose the topic tonight is building that resilience of players, and you know, there's no right and wrong in this. Everyone has a different opinion. Everybody um would have different ways. But I'm not. I'm going to keep it as simple as I can. I'm not going to get into that too scientific. Um, about it, but just as I say, we we'll have we we'll have lots of base. But I suppose 
we're, we're looking to, to try to explain the Taurus principles and the Taurus programs for me you may or may not be familiar with it was designed by the Leinster Council and it's, 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 it's talking about that player pathway you know, and, and all the different attributes along the way Taurus is the Irish for journey um, and you often hear players when, and I use it myself along the way you, you know when you finish up it wasn't about the destination it was about the journey um, so I think it's a uh, the, the journey of a player and, and, and the different pathway it's going to a player um, moves from, from whether it's the nursery at four or five years of age all the way through and the different challenges they meet along the way um, so we define identify and measure a resilience in a player this way is to build resilience using practical examples um, and this could describe what is the rocky road to success okay so there's an awful lot in that we could take one of those and um, maybe do a full webinar on it. So just go get through things fairly, fairly quick. Um, so the Taurus principles, uh, testing and challenging all players should be challenged. Um, so I suppose the one thing players, I call them kids, um, children particularly, they want to be challenged every time. So, you know, first thing I'm involved in, in the, the under eights in the club, my daughter goes down there when it's not too wet or, she feels that she's up for it, which is sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. But first thing you go in and they want to play a match, so they want to be challenged every time. They want they want a bit of competition, and, and that's always a good thing. So we have to make sure that we do that all the way through, and um, no matter what age group we are involved in. Okay, so understanding the players at the centre of the game resembles the game, so it's game based. All players involved all of the time, and should be an enjoyable, developmental, appropriate, and holistic GA experience. Okay, so that's the journey, that's the that's the acronym around it. Um, and as I say, for the vast majority of us, that, that journey is a bumpy one. Very, very few Brian Fenton's in the world where he was in the first day and never, here we are five years later and he's, he still hasn't experienced a, a defeat. Those guys are, are very, very few and far between. So that's the principles behind the, the Taurus program um, that's been rolled out through the Leinster Council over the last number of years and I think the feedback from it is very good and if, you know depending on what age group you're involved in I think it's it'd be great for you to if you haven't already done so to go in and, and um, any chance in your local club or in your area to, to, to get on some of that course and, and, and um, experience it's, 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 it's worthwhile and, and you get great benefit from it okay so that's what we mean by, by Taurus is the Irish for journey and the player's journey okay so the American Psychological Association, whoever these boys are sitting in a big room in Washington DC or somewhere like that, uh, defines resilience as the process of ad adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, or even significant source of stress. Okay, so realistically what we're saying is your ability to bounce back. You know, and, and when, whether that be in a game situation, it's often in the same game. So I'm sure there's loads of examples out there where some, some guys could play their best game and their worst game in the same game um, and that's a brilliant attribute to have some guys if, if or some players if if you know they don't start the game whether the first 15 minutes don't go well you know you might as well take them off and it takes them a while to get that that was to come back from that adversity or or the, the trauma or whatever word you want to put around it. So that's what we're looking at is that ability to keep coming back. Um, you know, seeing and seeing do we look at it as a failure or do we look at it as an opportunity to learn? And you know, we're all, it's all great when you're sitting down in the call it but being able from a player point of view or a coach point of view to be able to see that, to identify that and challenge that in your players and, and maybe make them aware um of the, the resilience or lack of it um, and, 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 and to try to adjust to it. So that's that's basically what we're looking at. It's, it's, it's that bounce back ability. Okay, so what are the benefits of a resilient player? And I love the picture in the middle, you know, the tarmac uh, and, and, and the weed coming in through it. You know, you think you'd have it, you'd ever cover when you'd, when you'd have uh, an inch uh, tarmac, but again, the weed is able to come up through it. So no matter what adversity is thrown in front of it, Oops, he's coming anyway. So, um, again, what are the benefits of a resilient player? The benefits within your team, okay? Um, so, they show adaptability. So, again, um, you know, they can, they can 
maybe play in a number of positions or they can they can go and, and um, you know if they're struggling in one position they, they're adaptable and they'll, 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 they'll go into another position and maybe improve the improve the team's performance okay so again maybe you could link coping skills to that in the face of adversity you're able to cope when things are not going well maybe you know could be a cornerback the first two or three balls his, his man kicks them over the bar but he settles himself and you know, can go on um, and, and, and fix the mistakes or be able to, to be able to cope and um, to get himself out of trouble okay so they welcome challenges um, setbacks provide opportunity to grow it We'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. So the strength of the team is the players. The strength of the players is the, is the team. Okay, so one is no good without the other. Okay, so the player, how mentally strong, how how resilient is him? Is he um, adds to a better team? That strength of the team uh, obviously adds value to the players. Okay, so finding the difficulty difficulty is not to be ashamed of. So create an environment uh, where that flourishes that's very self-explanatory um, not to be able to hang the head and, and oh, I'm not coming anymore because I had a bad game or maybe start blaming all around them you know if things are going well for, or if things are not going well for them they're not ashamed of it they'll take the challenge they'll, they'll put themselves in an environment where they learn and they'll grow um, so and they're able to deal with the, the tragedies and, and, and stresses um, be able to to be able to, to kick on from that so that's that's the benefits to your team everything we talk about as a player is how is a benefit to team okay so we'll, we'll strike on okay so i suppose maybe this is a time for for the pen and paper maybe might take a, a minute or so i'm looking at the my clock on my clock here is going up the quarter so we might give you or exactly quarter past so we might give you a minute but maybe just to jot down what your what do you think um, a resilient player looks like? Or even maybe write down the name of a really resilient player. That might be enough just to you know what you like in them. What do you see when you think of it? It could be a club player. Um, it could be it could be a, an inter-county player. It could be a player from a different code. You know, what does that player look like? What are the what are the values or what are the, the traits they show um, to make them to make them a resilient player? So we might just give you a minute. Um, on that, just to, just to, I suppose it, it gets you thinking about about where you see it and, and uh, what's what's the value of you know what do they look like what what do they do every day um, regardless of whether they play good or bad what what are their what are their actions um, so we'll uh, I'll stop talking now for for a minute or so and, and maybe just to, to write down them or you can type it in the box there if you want whatever suits you there's no there's no right and wrong at this. I was a little bit nervous coming down and I went back to I remember Christy Moore saying in the pint depot one time the pint was full and he was really really nervous and then they figured with him well they all knew who they were coming to see and were happy to come and see him come and see him so he said that was okay if they were okay with him he was okay with them when he went on and so I'm a little bit the same if you, you knew what you were getting and they all signed up so I'm happy enough that we're here together um, okay so I'm not sure. I'm not sure what you've wrote down, or maybe a player you you, you thought of. Um, but we, we might we might um, come back to that afterwards. Um, okay. So identifying resilience in the player. So what do we expect? Someone committed to cope with pressures. Okay. Just I'll go back to that. Stephen Clare, Noel McGrath, absolutely brilliant. Noel McGrath, Tipperary. What he went through. Um, you know, but off the field and 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 uh, with with his his health issues. Um, and yet back to still to one of the top players in the country so that's a brilliant a brilliant example and all was an all-star this year i think was he would that be a right column was he an all-star hurler uh, i think he was so um john mcgrath wicklow coming in there Robert McHugh, yeah um again went through went through huge huge uh, challenges but again again bounce back so there's we, you know we could talk about all those players uh i know my good friend there but early would be one that springs to mind for me again uh, health issues off the field, but also on the field, you know, injury after injury, you know, the shoulder gave him trouble, and again, just always there to always there to bounce back because he just looked he looked playing the game and was a brilliant player for us, um, all the time. So there's loads and loads of different lads like that that we know, and they don't have to be high profile players. They can be they can be lads in the club, no matter no 
matter what happens to them personally or, or on and off the field, they'll always always bounce back and, and give massive performance. So, um, okay, so what do we expect from a resilient identifying resilient resilience in a player? So they're committed, they can cope with the pressure, and um, planning an organization. Okay, so that's a big one. You know, they're, they're, they, have, they have everything planned and it, it becomes a routine for them. So regardless of you know, and it, it could be I know I, I, I kicked um I kicked freeze obviously from the ground and again I was very black and white in my process of kicking freeze. You know I, I, I judged it regardless of you know, I had a routine. So in my head the goals were always the same. So whether I was kicking in Alan Wood or I was kicking in Newbridge or I was kicking in Crow Park, the goals were the same. White, the black spot in the middle. So that's didn't change. The grass, okay, maybe Newbridge wasn't as good as Crow Park, but Alan Wood was. Uh, from the Lincoln there, people out there would probably disagree with me, but anyway, no. <laughs> uh, but again, the grass is more or less the same, or it's a swipe bit different. It, it might be as long as Crow Park, but again, I was happy with the grass. Um, that didn't change. So my technique didn't change. Um, so, and I did. I tried not to buy into the who was looking. So as far as I'm concerned, but it was one set of eyes, or sixty thousand sets of eyes, really didn't. But shouldn't come into the mix. So I had it planned and organised in my head. So that's sort of what I mean by that. Um, and that sort of helped me. Okay, quality practice again. You know, I always felt in that scenario when I was kicking, if I had the work done, you no, know, I was happy enough that I was going to miss one, but I was also confident that I had practiced it enough that my kicking technique was, wasn't going to let me down um, and that was something maybe I, I learned through other kickers in particularly particularly rugby where, where you know the, the best would miss and the best would stand up again and, 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 and kick the important score um, and realistic performance evaluations so that's that's very important too uh, behaviour so they never give up uh, they have a strong sense of self-belief um, and, and again we, we might talk to Later on about that one, that's that's really important. Um, they the problem solve to overcome setbacks. They are open to change. They understand their strengths and their weaknesses, and they set uh, goals and work towards them. Uh, they're consistent. Uh, I think the, the the understanding of the strengths and weaknesses is very important because I suppose we as coaches we always tend to you know focus on weaknesses. That's very important. You know. Um, normally something that you're strong at and, and that you're, you've, you're normally good at and you're normally good at it because you like doing it so it becomes a strength and I think it's very important not to forget if you want to build resilience in a player the strength to focus on the strengths are as important as the weaknesses you know and as coaches sometimes we don't we don't emphasize that enough we always talk about you know the practice the weak foot practice the, but it's very important to practice the strong foot as well um, and, and being players knowing what they're good at and again I suppose it, and I'm going to talk about myself now a good bit but sometimes as I say if we were all in the room we could have a better discussion but when I was playing I wasn't fast I wasn't strong I wasn't very skillful but I had one thing I was really good at and that was running and I, again no matter how the game was going I had it in my head I was going to, I was going to outrun my opponent, and eventually I get an odd kick at the goal, and maybe not play well, but chip on with a point or two because I, I run him into the ground. So that was my real strength as a player. I could, I had a good end, um, you know. So I suppose that helped. You know, even though I was, could be having a bad game, it was in my head that eventually I'll outrun this, I'll outrun this guy. I might not sprint him, but I'll out, I'll outrun him and maybe get half a yard. So I suppose that's what I mean by there, knowing the strengths and the weaknesses. Um, so and again setting goals and working to it and again if we were talking about goals I know we could talk here all day about the importance of the maybe getting into the, the mindset of setting goals and stuff but it is important um, you know and, and write down goals that was and always a bit of advice I give to I give the players as well write down realistic goals where you where you've been so you know if you're a, a, a cornerback would you get a block in and I think if you I would be a firm believer you might reach all your goals. You, you know, when I say realistic, you could say, well, I'd like to get 100 blocks in, but that's not realistic. You know, if I say, right, I'd like to get two blocks in, 
in a game and you get one block in, that's 50% of your, of your goal, which is probably, you know, it's one more than you get if you didn't focus on it. So, again, we could talk about all, all that, but they're very important behaviours um, to challenge in players, but you can identify them, um, that resilience in players by those behaviours. I know I'm flying through this here now, lads. So if there's anything along the way, tell me to stop or ask a question, please do so. Okay, so measuring resilience of players. Um, okay, and I put this this picture up. Um, Say nobody needs any introduction to who that man is. Um, Graham Garrity of Mead, Captain Mead in 99. Great player. I suppose the reason I did was uh, he came onto the me team and was probably one of the, the best half-backs in that few years in the country. Um, and then whether he decided, or I would imagine it was more Sean Boylan decided that, you know what, we need someone of Graham's ability to score. Um, and he was moved to the full forward line. Um, and I deal now with development squads and I deal uh, coaching and you get this thing as all well. and sometimes you get it from parents um, you know you're playing you play Johnny uh, corner, cornerback and he's, he's not he's a halfback you, know, you can play him a wing forward he's not he's a halfback um, and my message is to young people particularly coming into squads you're footballers you're here because you're footballers um, and I think the attitude of, of Graham Gerrard he epitomised that Rather than saying, well, you know, he's and I would I would have players parents come up to me and say, well, you know, he's you're playing him left wing and he can't he's he's a right wing forward and you're oh my god, you know, a footballer he's a footballer, you know, the skills of the game seem fit to play anywhere. Now I know maybe you might have the pace for a corner, the the, the burst maybe for a corner forward or maybe a corner back is good recovery and pace might be an issue and things like that, but I think. A lot of what I, I would my theory would be that you know if you're a cornerback you have to be able to kick the ball to your man an opponent whether it be a twenty five yard kick pass so you have to be an accurate kicker you have to good be able to catch it you know the basic skills are the same no matter where you play and it epitomised me for Graham Graham Garrity was that um, and and was able to prosper in in both positions so he would be a person I would I would always um, I played with Graham at, at uh, inter provincials level and you know while he was played on the edge and he was he was to me he was a born winner but to see him in operation you know when he, when he was a full flight you'd stand back and admire him he, he was a, he was a classy player um and sometimes when you're looking at players on the telly you might look at them and, and take a dislike at first you know but when i was involved and i was he was a, a little bit older than me but he was always about bringing you into the game and Encouraging you, and, you know, so he, he was a player that, that to me showed a massive amount of resilience. And um, so, measuring that resilience in a player, so a SWOT analysis would be a good way of doing that. So, where does the player see themselves? And uh, so, where does the coach see the player? And and sometimes get that 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 view of of of, of the different the different um, the different views. To the players here, you know, looking at the strengths, their weaknesses, their opportunity, and their threats. And I won't go into that too much detail. Um, so a self-assessment as as a player or as a coach, you know, um, are you subjective and objective? Okay. So and again, very important. You know, when you're trying to build a player, being objective is important. Dealing in facts because we get all there's there's eighteen of us online here now. We could watch it. A match here, and everyone will have a different opinion. Dealing in facts, and being able to say to the player, "Look at, you know, we took you out the forwards because your shooting was poor, and you had ten shots, and you only kick one point." So they're factual information. That's not just whether the coach likes you or not. It doesn't matter whether it's it's, you know, what emotions are out there. The facts, and I think self-assessment um, is something that you can do. And I know. It can be difficult because it's time and so on. You're trying to meet players, and you're trying to, but it is it is very important in building that resilience, and dealing in, in, in the factual information that's that's available to you. Um, so player profiling, we we'll talk about that as well. Um, um, so 
theory versus practice or engineering situations uh, in practice to facilitate growth. Okay, so you know whether they're they're offensive players, defensive players, whatever the case may be, to try to try build that resilience. Okay, so I'm going to hand over the column here now, and we're just going to play a small bit of a video. I think you'll kick into their column. We have a quick read. I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game with a shot. Johnny, you can unmute yourself there again, Johnny. Oh, apologies. Apologies, yeah. So, uh, just to go back over that, I said, the two the two videos I'm going to I show tonight are, are basketball videos. I'm not a big basketball fan. Um, I watch it up and down, but I think the, there's certain players um, that are just iconic figures. Um, now, within Ireland, we could name the iconic hurlers and footballers that are just, you know, they're just at a different level than everyone else. Um, but sports people all over the world, Michael Jordan is probably up there with, with Muhammad Ali or Babe Ruth or whoever, you know, Pele, Maradona, all these, these are just world class. And, and he was, um, and again, you know, sometimes when we're, when we're looking at players, we, we view them as, especially the top players, we think, oh, well, Everything goes well for them. Um, they, don't, they don't, you know, just it's, it's a natural thing. And I often hear hear people, and you could be listening to Sunday game, and, and the analysts be talking, "Oh, he's a natural footballer. He's a natural hurler." And you get this, and you, you get this thing that's oh, well, it's, it's it's all easy, and, um, and it's not. When you when you look at, you know, when you look at Michael Jordan there. He could have, you could say, his failure. All those stats he threw up of, you know, nine thousand shots. You know, the games he played, all the times he failed, he failed over and over and over. That's why he was successful. So there's the top, probably, the, arguably the greatest basketballer ever, and he failed over and over, and he puts that down to his success. So he, the resilience he showed, and again, there's documentaries on him, and but again, he was able to, he failed. Was people writing them off all the way through with that inner belief and um, to keep going, practice and practice. And that's why he was successful. That's a that's a you know a, an absolutely brilliant um a brilliant clip for for anybody, particularly young players to look at. Everybody fails. Everybody has has tough times, and yet even the best and the, the, their ability to bounce back. Um, so I, I think that's and I'm sure a lot of you have, have seen that. That clip before I definitely read, read about that quote from, from Michael Jordan. Um, okay, so uh, your star player is instructed. So we're just going to have a quick look at this a couple of scenarios, and I'm going to talk them through. And maybe maybe you might just jot down a few things, and we might we might talk about them at the end or whatever. Um, you know, we're looking about building a building resilience. And if if to be mindful, you know. Everything's in the nice and calm here now, and we're all sitting at home. Maybe some by the fire, and we're, we're, you know, it's different when you're in that situation. So, looking at this, your star player is instructed to go to the full forward in the minor county final. You know, maybe gives you maybe not going well, or you you see him, uh, maybe in a different role, but he he shouts back a little bit, John. Yeah, the body language is good, and he. he Jogs into the full forward line, and you, you know by him he's not happy, and maybe giving out to lads around him. Just the body language is right. What do you do? Um, quick 
where, what, what's the best thing as a coach to do? You know, now you can say that the right thing to do is maybe what we might like to think we would take him off um, because he has to learn, you know, is that the right thing to do? Or do we have to think, well, what's the benefit of the team getting to a county final? You know, I'll leave with him next week. Um, what's the best thing? What do we feel would be just the best thing? Just one sec there, yeah. Johnny, if you don't mind. Um, yeah. Guys, I just I see the message there from Michael Behan about the audio breakdown. Um, if, just to make sure it's not an issue across the board, if there is guys struggling with audio, can you give me a thumbs down? If your audio is okay, you might just give us a thumbs up and we can try and rectify it if it is an issue. So, thumbs up if the audio is okay. And thumbs down if the audio is an issue. Yeah. See, Sean. Sean Taff is having a problem with it. Carl. It seems to be a bit mixed there. Okay. Um, guys, I'm going to clear the status here and just, there's one other option we have. Um, sorry about this now, just. Um, how are you finding my audio? Um, I'm just going to mute you for a sec, John. Um, when I'm speaking, I think there's somebody else in the background there with the mic on. Robert, your mic, I think, might be on. I'm just going to set you to mute as well. Okay, guys, is um. You might just give me a thumbs up if my audio is okay. So I can get John to work off this computer if it is, if that's a help. Okay, so I think my one is working a little bit better than John's then. Is that it? Would that be a fair? Yeah, okay. I'll pass this computer over to John then because he's actually sitting in the house with me. <laughs> We're back. Yeah, hopefully. Okay, so I'm just looking at a couple of responses, Robert. Uh, Robert McHugh, get a message to him with the importance he is to the team and the move uh, could get us to a county final, build up a self esteem. Uh, yeah, brilliant. Uh, Stephen, I had a discussion with him before the game as to play early challenge game, Chatham. In a break of play and communicate why he's been sent to full forward, make him see the bigger picture. Exactly. So, and it's probably the other thing we have to be mindful of um, is that it doesn't just appear at county minor level uh, or at minor level. It's probably maybe there's maybe signs of it all the way through, and you also have to dis you have to decide that he's going through maybe a developmental stage you know everybody's different you look back at your own self at that age and you, you'd be embarrassed by some of the things you're doing but I think the big thing is to pull him aside have a chat and make him see the bigger picture and if it continues then you know you have to make him realise um, it's the long the long term the long term benefit is is to, to develop that actual aspect of his game um, and we've all seen them um, and maybe you know if it's really bad, you might just have to have to take a take a, the slack and say, look, it, I'm not going to put up with this. Um, you know, there's a place, yes, there's a place called stop, and we're we're not going to. Do it. So these are things you're, you're going to face. Um, but I think that the, the feedback, you know, 
um, talking to him, most people will take it on the chin and, and you move on. But it's very, it's very important that the body language is right and he can be a, a massive team player. Um, and 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 the he's benefited the team being on and that you know even the even the fact that he you feel that he can do a job for you at full at, in the full forward line, um, that no one else is capable of doing all of a sudden then he sees in a, a bigger picture the bigger picture so, um, that's that's also very important. Colin, I can't stick this. Uh, okay, yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> now so here's another scenario we we, we sometimes face. So your under your star player in under sixteen has an attendance record of twenty five percent of training. First round of champions coming up on Saturday. Okay, so he's not there a lot of the time. What's the best thing to do? Now again, you have to be careful. Um, would he be there if he had his own way of getting there? Um, you know, would he be? Was there communication with parents? Uh, all these things have to have to keep have to come into come into play. So, what is the best thing to do? Do you start him? Um, is is it a case of that he's he's um that you're trying to tell him yeah he's 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 an important part of the team but we've certain standards here and he hasn't met those standards are we happy to do that so again there's loads of different scenarios yeah there's a lot of lots of stuff coming in here it depends Gary you're dead right it does depend um possibly playing a number of sports okay and we 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 discussed that actually Derek O'Brien that's a very good point so you know if he's playing if he's playing hurling if he's playing maybe a bit of rugby, whatever, there's only so many days in the week. Um, again, that's yeah, that's come in. Depends on the values you establish at the start of the year. Absolutely. So you, you set out your agenda. You set it out at the start of the year. So and and maybe maybe a bigger thing is to, for the team to set out. So sometimes what's important to me is not important to the team. So maybe that's worth a, a session. Say, right, lads, what do you want from this year? What's the standards you feel? Not going to be my standards. Are going to be yours and. That could be enough to, to make make the importance of it. Um, so, um, yeah. So, Michael Bean, he isn't your star player. Your assessment was based on what criteria? Exactly. So that's a fair point too. Um, what do, what do we judge a star player? What why? Normally, it is that he's, he's technically very good. Um, so making them realise that yes, you have to be technically very good and technical players are really, really important. And we, but we all know that just technical players aren't going to aren't going to be the, the ones um that are going to win your game. So we all know the really skillful players and if we the team with them we win nothing. Um, because they don't have the other attributes. Um, and and maybe and I see Noel Slattery says leave him on the sideline for the first game he has to understand for his poor attendance. So maybe that, um, you know, we probably should have spoke to him before it comes to if it's an issue coming up the championship. Maybe us as coaches haven't done their job, but you know, so it's it's identifying it, it's addressing it, and it's making him aware of it, and and maybe letting feedback from him. Um, you know, what, where does he see it? Does he see a problem in it? Um, and, and there, but it is. It, it, it does depend on an awful lot of things, but again, it's knowing your players and, and making them aware of, of the, just turning up the train and every now and again is, is not it's not going to be good enough to get them on the team. And it's maybe creating a bit of competition that, you know, someone else is going to be there, someone else will get the jersey, and it doesn't he's going to have to fight for it to get it back, and, and that builds a bit of resilience. So these are these are scenarios uh, that we meet that we meet every day. Um, so it is important to it's important to be aware of them and to talk them out. Okay. Okay, and again, we just 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 really quickly go through this. So, a player under fourteen team, uh, reasonably skillful, but is struggling physically, and maybe weakens the team's performance. But long term, you feel he has the potential to make a senior player. Again, what what do you do? You know, maybe too small. And I hate this. And I hate talking about people being told you're too small. I was told all my life I was just too small. Not so much small, just too light. Um, you know, so being. So where do you and as I say, I'm involved with, with development squads and you're you're trying to pick a panel and we're very lucky in Kildare that you have loads and loads and loads of of um players and particularly at fourteen even fifteen some of them haven't even started growing yet uh, and you're trying to 
where do you, where do they sit in? Maybe their their physical strength is letting them down, but you feel so. I think it is very important to be aware of it. Um. So we just look at the breed. Uh, so Joe Joe McAndrew says could it impact the rest of the team and cause more problems. Um, where other players follow need to be. Uh, addressed. Yeah. With the parents again, yeah, and and you can get a lot of like, you're, you're looking at all the attributes again. Where where you fit in? So is winning more important at, the, at this age group? And um, it could benefit the team to win because you know we want to get used to winning and get them to taste success because they might not always taste it. Um, but again, if he's holding you back and then. If you're strong enough to believe, no, he's doing all the things right, I'm going to stick it with it. And then you get other parents maybe having a go. What are you doing playing Johnny Guys? Jesus, sure. You know, he, he's struggling there. Um, so it, it's trying to get that balance right. And if you have, if you're strong in principle, I suppose the big thing is to be able to say that the reason I'm playing is this and I'm trying to build that resilience and maybe build the resilience in the rest of the team to say, well, look, at John doesn't have everyone, but how can we play him in? So, Again, back to one of our original points, you know, the team is only the players make the team, but the team make the players. Um, so we'll just go through maybe a couple of your a couple of your points uh, coming in there. I'm sure you can see them all yourself. Player develops it at the a uh, player develops at the heart of what we are we do. At that age, we are looking uh, for a skill set and technical proficiency. Yeah, brilliant point, Robert. Encourage keep his spirits up and give him a few tips in playing. Keep the ball out of the tackle and move it quicker. Um, good stuff. Uh, due to each player having difficult different growth part, patterns, he or she can be coached technically and physically using uh, yeah protocol. Yeah, absolutely. And and the other side of it is we're developing maybe their their um you know their mental approach to the game. So they're able to think their way out of it um, because. You know, they don't have the strength. We've all seen players where they're big and strong at 14 and then when everyone else catches up, they struggle. So, you know, this could be the way this this uh, young player is able to build that resilience to get around. Well, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not strong enough, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to take him on physically. I'm able to use another athlete. So you're building that resilience and hopefully um, he learns from that and maybe when he does take a growth spurt, you know, you're a really good player because you've given him the opportunity. And there's no guarantees, so it, it's very difficult. But again, with the resilience in mind, you're looking to build them. Um, you're looking to build them to see can you make them a better player, even though it might mean that you're not getting clapped on the back in in December when they're all giving out the medals or that the county player comes down to present medals. Unfortunately, our under fourteen team didn't have a great year, you know. But you're happy enough that yeah. We didn't have a great year, but we, we, we developed the players. So, again, it's just something to be aware of and to build that resilience. Okay, so, again, it's it's uh, summed up. And some of you may have thought, I, I love showing this this uh, this bit of a, a quote from, from Johan Cruyff. Uh, I let all the youth teams play the same way. Like the first team, I always put the emphasis on learning. Sometimes... I had the suspicion that you coaches were more concentrate, uh, concerned with winning. They cared about their own reputation, which is a big statement. Uh, I cared only about the interest of the club. When a player with talent couldn't defend, I put him in the defence so he could learn. Uh, but that could cost a point, but I didn't care. I was busy developing the players. And this is one of the top, was he a top player, but a top coach. Um, you know, the reputation and, and you know, we, we hear about egos and everybody has an ego. Everyone wants to do well. Everybody wants to be told you did well. That's that's just the way we're, we're programmed. Um, so you, you, it's very it's very important. Um, but where does that come in to the de development of the player? And that's a really powerful, you know, he didn't care about winning. You know, imagine putting your centre forward back, uh, right back because you thought he wasn't defending well. Not be and we see these players then at, at the top level, you know, the really good players, the strikers, but they'll they'll work like hell to get the ball back. Um, so that's that's I suppose that's the big thing he was able to do, and he was strong enough, and maybe he had the personality within the club to be allowed to do it, where because he had done it at the top, um, and he, he was strong enough in his beliefs that he was 
he was a uh, he challenged anyone that challenged him. He was he felt that his values were were for the best of the of the club and the team. So again, it's um it's, it's a strong it's a strong enough. And you, we could debate. We could have a chat about about all that. And uh, Michael, in, inclusion. I'm just going to read out now. Inclusion and participation should come first. It's a tricky one to balance while in competition. You need to know your own values in respect to playing at 14. If the player enjoys playing, we need to figure out as a mentor how to balance this. And that's a brilliant point. You know, it is. Uh, we do have to try get the balance, and it's, it, 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 it's just you know, and making that player, giving him game time, not giving him game time, tell him why he's doing well, tell him why he has to work on it, and, and try to bring him on that on that journey is, is very important. Um, Okay, and I, I do realise I'm, I'm flying on here. Okay, so how can coaches build resilience? So always back to your Taurus parents with test and tweak and challenges. Okay, always every every for me every training session should always be challenging, always be testing the players, and not be afraid to to, to tweak the session and um, to build that that resilience. So you're always looking to to, to Make sure no matter who, what the player is, you're challenging them all the time, and that can be reflective. For me, a training session should be what went well the last day. What do we need to work on? And this training is going to be reflective of it. So, you know, if if we decided that, you know what, we put up two thirteen, we lost by three points, but we let in six goals defensively. So our session tonight is going to about be about defending. You know, and how do we challenge that? So, how do we get our corner forward to work that bit harder to defend when we don't have the ball? How do we get that brilliant midfielder to because he drives forward and runs through everyone and can lift the roof of the net over? How do we, you know, what is he like going the other way when, when he doesn't have the ball? So, uh, our our coaching session will will test the players if it's based on on defensively or offensively, whatever the case may be. You can tweak it, and it's challenging to the players. Um, and obviously, it's 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 game based coaching. And I think that in itself is, is a great way to um, <clears throat> to build resilience through your coaching. Challenge all the time, and it's reflective on on how the game is going, or how maybe the previous couple of games are going. Um, you're bringing in the game based situations. Okay. Okay. So. How can coaches help build resilience? Okay, so reframing. Some of you may be may be, um, may be familiar with this. Okay, this is a process of changing the way we view a situation. So, example, instead of a loss is a failure, it's a learning experience. Use it as a valuable opportunity to learn from performances and even view how the winners performed. What did they do better than us? Okay, um, another then ask why a player didn't perform. Can we turn into a how can I improve the next time? Okay, so maybe having those those chats as a as a group, um, having those chats uh, with individuals. What did we do well? What didn't we do? Why did it not? You know, why why did it not go well? And what and the most important is what are we going to do different? And that to me is the big thing. So no matter even if you're in a drill or you're in a, in a, a game based drill, you know, stopping it. What's going well? What's not going well? And what are we going to bring in to this? We're going to go back into it. What are we going to do with it? So that's the big thing for me. And and, and go into it again. Okay, we said for argument's sake, we said we were we weren't aggressive enough in the tackle. Go into the second period. We're going to be more aggressive in it. Did we do that? Are we happy with where it's at? No, we go into it a third time. Can we bring this to a new level? So <clears throat> we're reframing all the time. So I think that's that's really really important, um, and getting that feedback, because you can see the things as a coach when you're playing it's a totally different thing. You're, you're split second to make a decision. I've often been on the field and everything is going wrong. You can see a fire ever, you, you go, but you're not just sure how to fix it. So I think that's really really important um, to be able to to stop a session, get feedback. What are we doing wrong? What are we not doing well? How are we going to fix it? Let's bring that to our next. So that in itself is how I feel that coaches can best build that resilience within their team, um, you know, and within within the individuals. You can pull a player out and say, "Look, didn't he got 
<coughs> excuse me, involved as much as you could have. We need to. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Okay. <coughs> Taking a breath the wrong way there, and I'm sorry about that. Okay, so how can coaches help build resilience? Okay, so we control the controllables. Realizing that there are things 100% we control over. These are things we can influence, and there's others we've no control over. Spend your time and energy dealing with the things you have control and influence over. And a couple of examples are. <coughs> the things we can't control, our work ethic, body language, being coachable, and I'm sure if if we look for, and maybe we should, throw it, lads, you know, throw in a couple there yourselves. You know, there's ten or twelve or easy things we could. What are we in control of? So maybe over the next thirty seconds or so, start typing in a few things that we feel we are in control of. That that'll help that that could benefit everybody. His assistant hands me a, a glass of water. Attendance. No, brilliant. Yeah. Again, back to me. <laughs> back to me, father. Just be there. Be there all the time. Your attitude. Absolutely. Jonathan Dunn, that's a brilliant one. Um, it's a really good one. There's a few coming in, so we'll stick with it for a minute. Time management, Stephen, yeah, time management is a really good one. Uh, our response to events that impact us, yeah, Michael, that's, a, that's an, an excellent one as well. Your discipline, again, no, that's a really good one. You can, you can only control that yourself, even though sometimes it's hard. Uh, building confidence in the players, which are language. Brilliant, yeah. So body language, but also what you say. You know, you're in control of that. Um, I know there's one or two still typing. We'll, we'll give you another couple of seconds. And we'll, coach needs to model the behaviour and what's the players. Coach <clears throat> needs to model the behaviours he wants the players to have. Absolutely brilliant. And again, on that one, Carl uh, mentioned it. I remember reading Alex Ferguson's autobiography, and he took over when he took over Aberdeen. And um, the first couple of matches were weren't going well at all. And he he also talked about the positive for having for him to have a mentor. And I, I, I his name, a good friend of his, I, I can't think of his name, said to him, "I don't see Alex Ferguson in that team." And basically, what he meant was, "I don't think, see all the values that you think in your team." That I think the call that's that's what you mean by that is is you know the coach needs to model the behaviors he wants in the team. So if you want a team to be disciplined, you can't be shouting at officials or the opposition or or maybe the opposition management or abusing players. And that's really really important. Okay, uh, and we'll finish on, on Rory's on Rory's uh, session planning and uh, control of sessions. Again, totally in your control. Okay, so we get the idea of the things we control and we should really, really concentrate on them. There's other things we can influence, you know, the referee, teammates and the opposition. So again, a lot of that is down to, you know, we're all human, abusing referees. If I, and I, I've refereed one match in my life and I think that'll be, uh, that'll be it as far as refereeing goes. But if that's given me abuse, they were going to work harder for it. That's a natural thing, you know. You're going to work harder for your freeze. Um, again, your teammates, so positive language, encouragement. Um, you know, you can get so much better out of, out of your teammates if you're if you're um, if you're positive towards them. And the opposition, I can so <clears throat> again maybe not being a, uh, abusive to the opposition, uh, all that sort of stuff. You know, you can influence uh, as much you get back. Okay, and then you've no control, weather, supporters, uh, skill of a teammate, um, you know, and, and that's something we can we can get bogged down on as coaches and players. You know, again, you're in the, in maybe in the full forward line and, you know, first man is always taken off as normally the corner forward and 
really you're totally dependent on the supply you've got. Now, your job is to win it when it comes in, but I've often played in there. I remember that I got a tr- one minor trial, half an hour. We played Wicklow up, and any, I'm not sure. If I'd say one or two names I, I recognise, and it mightn't be the person I think they are, but uh, they would know the backfield in clay, and it's a small bit of a hill, and it's always mucky. And we played Wicklow in a minor trial. Um, and, of course, I was a sub for the first half, and a bit of a wind was blowing down the hill. At half time, I was told to come on, corner forward, and I did not feel the ball once. Never got as much of a touch of it, uh, and the, I was told thanks, but no thanks. So, <laughs> you know, not like you could do. The ball never came in. Wicklow just ran out by us. It was a strong wind. We were playing up the hill against the wind, and that was my county minor career. Half match in the backfield play. So, you know, I could go home and beat the crap out of myself saying you're not this, you're not that, but what could I do? It wasn't, it wasn't. I couldn't control anything in that situation. So, again, you control the controllables. Um, okay, so, modelling resilient behaviour. Okay, so, a player who is successful is used as a model uh, for your other players to learn from. Okay, and we talked about that and we gave some great examples. Um, you know, and I used Graham Garrity, you know, there was a few, uh, a few different players came up. So, Normally, you know, using that player, why why do you like that player? You know, and, and using them as examples. Um, Modeling is about replicating through patterns, actions, emotions uh, of successful players. So, what, how do they behave? Their body language, and their work ethic. All those things are massively important. And you know, that can help to build build resilience in the players. You make them aware of that. You know, so even asking them why why they're why they like one player, or maybe send them home and say, "Look, I want you to look at, um, you know, look at a player that's playing at the top of the game in the position, uh, he's playing." I'm going to ask one or two years next week, "Who did you pick and why did you pick them?" Okay, and maybe teasing it out then. Well, I'm playing a half back, and you know, Jack McCaffrey is my favorite player. Why is he? And then maybe the important things that maybe he didn't identify. Obviously, he's very fast and he gets scores and. Maybe teasing it out a little bit. Well, you know, he came back from a bad injury. He worked really hard. All those things that made him good. And I suppose it's a bit like the Michael Jordan. All these top players that are supposedly natural players, while they might find some aspects of the game a little bit easier, it comes down to that building resilience along the way. Yeah, so that's a really good way of, from a coaching point of view, to try um build that resilience in in in, in the modelling of the behaviours. Oh, wrong. Yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> resilient players attribute their success to those elements that can control their influence. That's self-explanatory. Uh, therefore, success is not something uh, someone else's responsibility. The same for any poor performance. Okay, so they're able to take control of their success uh, or failure. It doesn't. It doesn't matter to them. They'll still be able to to to, to build that resilience and not. Not blame, not put the blame elsewhere, and that can be difficult. There's no doubt about it. Um, and as coaches, particularly as parents, because um, I know even you know I I go home, and um, my ma tell me I was always great. My dad would tell me the way it was, and sometimes I needed to go to my mother, uh, just to help me get over knowing exactly that I was I was poor today, but I needed <laughs> I needed to be told, um, by the ma that well. Sure, if they, if they had to pass it into you a bit more, you may have got a few more scores. No, I, I knew that that wasn't the case, but that's what she was always there to tell me. Um, so, again, being able to say, okay, it's not anyone else's fault. What did I do as a player? How can I, you know, if I, if I didn't feel the ball wasn't coming into me, what could I have done to make it? So, could, did I go out? Did I, did I say to the, you know, did I swap out? Did I go out to the midfielder and say, look, it's lads. Not enough ball coming in, kick it in, you know all those things. What what else can you do? So it's controlling what you can control. Um, players should be encouraged to, to be the best they can be, not looking to blame anyone else for the performance. Okay, and I think that's very, uh, very very important. And and you'd be surprised when you do talk to parents or to players, and and 
they might, you know, if you ask them, well, what did you do or what did you think, normally they will bring in some other exterior factor. Um, and we all do it because that's just the way we're wired. We like to be, we like to be able to put the blame. Yeah, no, I understand it wasn't great, but I was open for a pass. And maybe if I got that pass, I might have got a score. Maybe that would have settled me. And that might be true. Um, but when we talk as, as coaches, we always come back to what could you have done better? What are you going to do in the future? You know, what did you learn? What What are you going to do with those learnings now? And that, to me, would, is a brilliant way of, of, of building resilience. Forget about the pass you didn't get. Forget about, you know, um, the other, the full four coming into your space. Forget all about that. What are you going to do? What did you learn? Um, and I think that's from a coaching point of view. It definitely does help to build resilience. And and, and maybe getting them to the player to write it down and come back to you and say, well, look, I'm going to do A, B and C. And then after the next match, did you do that? No, I did A and B. And it showed in the performance, I have a lot of work to do on C. And, and those sort of conversations. And I, I do understand it can be difficult. You could have 20 lads and say, how in the name of Jason am I supposed to get all around to these? But again, you know, <clears throat> as I said, there's, there's parents, there's players, and there's coaches here. Um, and, you know, when we talk about the coaches, we tend to just think about the guy that hands out the jerseys and picks the team and trains the team. But we're, we're all coaches. Parents are coaches. Um, Players are coaches. They'll influence the player beside them. So I think that's that's important to, to realise. And sometimes, you know, the parents are the biggest coaches. They're the ones that will, when the bag is fired in the corner, they're the ones that will pick it up. And they're the ones that build resilience. And not tell them, oh, it's always someone else's fault. You know, I say, well, look, it didn't go well for you today, but what, what, what did you learn out there? How are you going to bring that forward? You know, so sometimes the coaches can be the, or the parents can be the, the biggest, the biggest coaches. Um, there was a, there was a guy involved in a local club, and he used to be. He said, "I used to give out about parents that they, that they just drop the kids and go. Um, none of them would ask, come in and ask for a hand." And he said, "I, I was involved with the under 16s last year, and I wish to God they just drop the kids and go, because they, he found them the most difficult. So, and I'm sure we all we all know them as well. So, you know, we're all coaches, and, and uh, our actions and." The encouragement we can we can give players um, realistically, you know where they're at and, and, and their, their, how how they can improve. So it is very important. Okay, <clears throat> this is an interesting one. Okay, so highly developed skill technical skills. When we talk about skill, technical skills, we're talking about the the, the, the skills of the games. Okay, so players who are exceptionally uh, Excuse me. Uh, exceptionally te- technical and physically competent are usually more resilient to setbacks in their performance. So when a player has experienced a poor performance, those who have high skill levels realize uh, recreate a significant result. A successful result is not about uh, reinventing the whole process. Okay. So, and I think we can all relate to that. So, again. They're technical. It makes you rebound faster. You've, you've, you've. I suppose it's, it's, it's to do with self belief. And, and the example at the bottom, I know that's very text heavy, is Dean Rock in the 2017 All Ireland final. He missed a free in the first half. That he, if he gave him 20 balls, he kicked 20 of them over the bar. You'd be putting your house on him, um, and he missed it. And then last kick of the game, unbelievable pressure, and to win an All Ireland, um. Lee Keegan firing GPSs at him and sails over the sails over the black spot. So, you know, how do you how do you relate one to the other? Not as much pressure in the first one, not as difficult, not as far out, maybe not as many uh, outside influences, and yet he misses. But he's developed that technical skill to an, uh, to a level um, that he can. When the pressure came on, he stepped up, and, and the result was was. Um, the result was the same. You could be, you could be, you could say the same maybe about David Clifford, who's the, the talk of the place at the moment, and rightly so. The first All Ireland final this year missed a few early on that you'd expect him to get, but again, you know, just had such belief in his technical ability that he kept going, and, and eventually he landed it. You know, massive game the, se- the second day as well. Um, you know, so 
I, th- I think it's there's, there's loads of examples, and I'm sure, um, <clears throat> I'm sure there there um, there's loads more of different examples. Uh, Joe, you have a question. Um, Joe McAndrew, are technically skillful players more confident in general? Um, yeah, I, th- I think they probably are. I suppose there's a, there's there's always a fine line between confidence and arrogance. Um, confidence is to me, for me anyway, and again go back to my own. For me, confidence was when I had the work done uh, and when I was fit. They were the two things I I always felt confident. You know, when I had the hours put in, particularly when I was kicking freeze, if I felt I had the work done, you just you knew by the, the ball striking your foot, you, you knew by the feel of it it was going over the bar. Um, so I, I, I think there would be that confidence. It is, it is when, when you're, when you're after bringing your, your skill level because you're all, you're never there that it's totally perfect. You never get to a point. That's it. That's done now. They're always the basic skills, and you're watching the top soccer players. They're all. It's just basic stuff they do really well. If, you know, Sky Sports come in and they're, they're maybe. You know, Liverpool are warming up before a match, and it's all just little touches, little skill. You know, the basics that they do very well, but they're always, always, always doing them, um, and and they have confidence in it. So I think, I think, technically, when your your skill is at a level, it does bring about confidence. It's not going to get you over the line. If arrogance slips into that, I think you can be in a small bit of trouble. But in general, I think. Uh, I think it's very it's very important that the, you bring your technical skills to a level that that it generates confidence. Um, Robert, all about belief and trust. Uh, his method, he does it so many times. It's repetition. Yeah, and and the golfers would say the same. Um, they would always say, you know, it's it's ball out, nothing changes. It's all about the technique. Um, even though it's it can be different. It's it's a lot more calm situation in other sports than, than would be in Gaelic football or hurling for that matter. Um, but yeah, it's it's trusting yourself that you've to, again, it's repetition. You've to, you've the work done. And uh, Cahill, back to the skills. Having a good skill foundation is better than short term results in the game. Yeah, and and I suppose from coaching point of view, um, you know, you you've got to create an environment because I'd be a believer that coming out to the field two nights a week, um, you're not going to get the skill level up to the high up to the level. That it would be, it would be, um, really, where you're really, really competent. Um, and nowadays, whether we like it or not, we don't, you know, there's so many other things for, for people to do. You know, there's, there's games, there's other sports, you know, how many times would it, and we do it at a young age. So I'm sure there's, there's loads of people here that say they're doing, oh, he never leaves the ball out of his hand, never, and that goes great till 14. 15, he's always out practicing, and then he doesn't maybe practice as much because he's a bit of homework to do tonight now, and then, you know, he's, what, he's other things, distractions come in, um, so you don't maybe don't get to work as much work, as much work to, to, to keep at your technical skills, uh, and then there's, there's so much other stuff on, you know, there's so many games now that you're going from one one game to the next game, and you could have three or four games in the one week. Where, where are you supposed to get time to practice? So, but it is always the technical skills. I think it def- definitely helps develop that resilience. Um, Gary, a lot of intercounty teams nowadays have the benefit of working with sports psychologists and performance experts. This is a big advantage. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, um, it is. It is. It is an advantage. Um, goal setting is a massive thing. Visualization, visualization is a massive thing. Um, and I, I, I was old school a little bit. I was sort of maybe coming, only coming into play when I was getting towards the end. Um, but the visualization was a big thing. I remember, um, um, the Irish rugby team were, <clears throat> were down in Carton House as they used to be, and Kieran McGinney organised that. I went out with a session with with O'Gara and Sexton. They were doing a kicking session, so it was organised that I went out with a bag of balls and they were kicking on Neil's balls and. Um, you know, it was it was amazing the way to see what they like. I would say I go out and I kick, kick a hundred balls, and O'Gara thought this was off the a hundred balls. Shit, shit, your leg is fall off you. Yeah. He would have went out and he would have maybe only kicked his kicking session would be twenty balls, but it was I'd be firing the one wouldn't have gone over the bar. I'd be setting up another one where he was 
he was um you know could leave two minutes before it was all routine but the big thing that I got from him was his visualization um, and he'd have in his head when he looked at the goals was or when, when he when he looked at the post was he could see a pink circle where he got pink from I don't know but a pink circle that's what he could see and he focused on that um, that point every time and he over in his head or and that was the first sort of um sports psychology really I could see it on a very um real level, you know, the to the extent that they that he was going through. So it is it is a help, there's no doubt about it. Um but I suppose again you could use it and say, Well I don't <clears throat> I don't get the opportunity to do that again it's controlling the controllable. But I know a lot of a lot of players um at the highest level would say it does help them um some buy into it big time and others would dip into it um, if you look at sports psychology and I, mean, I was on a, a podcast with Colin Parks and he just laughed at me when I gave him this that but a, a, a sports psychologist would reckon that 80% of the peak top performance um, comes what goes on in your head and 20 is physical so whether agree or disagree with that's that I don't know but um, and we spend so much time on that below the neck so your physical fitness or skills and um, to try to get that top, top performance how much time do we spend on the uh, psychological probably not as much but there you go that's we could talk about we could talk about that for a long time I'm conscious of the time here uh, as well Colm um, we're probably we're gone we're now on way yeah. over but anyway we're a little bit over but um I think lads will be happy enough. Yeah. And I think you've you've a couple bit more to go on it, so I'd say continue work away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, sure. Look at the, I won't get offended if anyone logs out. Put it that way. Um. Okay, we might. Okay, I might just just read over this. Okay, so this is something. Question came up to me for me before about you know, underage teams doing really well, um, winning all underage titles is never a problem, and then struggling to bring that to adult level um, you know it's rather in hindsight you do maybe would do differently um, you know I suppose teams that are winning all the time because we always focus on the focus on the losing you know teams can win how do we how do we develop that how you know do we do we challenge the just do we challenge them enough that, and we all want to go to win, I've never been in a dressing room where a manager said, "Look, we're, we're working on our resilience today, now, lads. So if we don't win, there's no problem." Um, you know, so and and maybe just have a good group. But you know, if winning becomes just the norm, do we struggle when it's uh, later on? So it, it's it's a tough one. It's a tough one to get to get right. Um, <clears throat> yeah, go back to Cruyff, Cahill. You're dead right. Play them out of position to challenge them more. That can be, you know, that can be a really, a really beneficial thing. You might get the, you might, it mightn't, um, it mightn't go down well with everyone. But again, you're, you're, you're thinking of the bigger picture, you know, and, and being able to do that and bring these group on to hand them. To me, success with it in within coaching is getting your under 14s. If you can get, if you have a panel of 24, even 24 to the under 15 manager. Making sure that they're still there, they're still trying, they're still enjoying it, and they're still trying to learn and improve. Um, <clears throat> so tr- try and keep them grounded. Overconfidence is worse than underconfidence, which is which is a very relevant point. And again, no problem with confidence, but sometimes confidence can can um, <clears throat> sometimes confidence can can spill into arrogance. So that's where where you can be in trouble. Rotate well, the players and give them time. Uh, give time to the weaker players. Think of the li- little Johnny. Yeah, absolutely. Poor little Johnny gets an awful time. But yeah, yeah, absolutely. Rotate. Look at the challenges you're getting. You know, can you can you do without some of your 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 bigger player or your stronger players at that age group? You know, will they? Um, will they? You know, how will they react if you leave them on the line? Things like that. So. You know, there's there's loads of discussion around that. Um, let's see. Okay, so again, successful teams, player rotation, stronger opposition, 
what things we talk about, challenge certain players in different age groups. Um, uh, take the players out of comfort zone. You know, looking to challenge them all the time. And for teams that are are, are struggling, um, building that resi- dealing with the, the failure end of it. So, so you're setting realistic goals, making it fun, selective in your challenge, continue to develop uh, and monitor at, uh, monitor at, at the attitudes and identify identify improvements and share them with players okay so john i'm i'm conscious i don't want to skip over anyone so i'm i'm f- firing across the messages jonathan uh huge drop off rate from finishing underage and moving to adults sometimes only the best get a chance need to uh, be a, a plan to keep developing these players yeah and that can be really challenging particularly in bigger clubs uh, i know like i would look at players that maybe were in, in our club when we were younger and I often remember trying to get minor teams out and you're you know you'd be knocking on last doors on a Sunday morning and but we had you were you were let anyone that showed any bit of promise you pulled them back you didn't let them go now I look at maybe a, a club some of the bigger clubs like you know they're winning every age group and then when they get they could have like you take Nath with three under 14 teams or two under 15 two under 16 two minor teams and then they have to get older, you lose a lot of those players because there's nowhere to fit them all in. And that can be that can be a challenge. Um so giving them the opportunity to play can be can be uh, the, the biggest challenge. And you know, we all want to play the game and if we're not getting de- to play there, we might play somewhere else or go to another sport. And there's obviously other things when you're working and you know, people pick up injuries. So there's loads of different loads of different but I think it, it is a big thing to, to drop off from players. And you know we can look and are we giving them too much? So there's loads of discussion around that. But I think to be able to build resilience, whether your team are, are successful or or or, or struggling, there, there is ways of doing it. I think that's the important thing. So the rocky road to success. So again, I, I go back to my Sunday game. You know, this is natural. This is great. It's there's very few Brian Fenton. You know, they're just it's start and everything's great and it's so it's it's black most of it so people think it's it's just it's it's nice and easy um oh i'm gone now how did that happen colin um i don't know how that could can i move that along anyway the the, the reverse of that was uh, the, oh they missed the animation yeah so the next slide that came in was just going to be jagged nice and jagged um, that there's that there's loads of loads of uphills and downhills and good days and bad days and you have to take them you have to take them on um and and deal with them as as they come so it is it is very important that it's it's a it is a rocky road and no matter what sport or what how good or how bad you are you're going to experience that along the way all right um okay so again just a couple of pictures to the rocky road Okay, so the first one uh, is Colm O'Neill. Okay, so Colm, brilliant underage player, did the crucial three times, three times, doing it once would finish a lot of players, but again had the ability to bounce back, belief in himself, um, wanted to play at the highest level, wanted to be the best he could be, wanted to represent his his, his family, his club, his county, um, so he showed massive resilience. Again, Henry Shefflin, there's a famous picture of a, a team in Kieran's College, um, where you know one of these subs has is the game's most decorated player was struggling to make it all the way along, um, I think he might have got a little bit of playing a Kilkenny minor, but very little, uh, and look what he turned out to be. Loads of resilience, loads of challenges, um, loads of picking up the bag from from the parents and saying, "Come on, life is tough, hurling is tough, let's go again," um, and, and he built that. You know, and we think, how did he get? If you look at him, you 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 think, how oh, sure he never struggled. You know, so he met the struggles, and then Roy Keane, a very divisive character, is one I like, just purely for his resilience. Um, you know, imagine he wrote the clubs looking for them to give him a chance. You know, it was on the Dole and Cork, and look what he became. Everywhere he turned, no, you're too small, you're not good enough, you're feisty, you're you know you're too aggressive and. Maybe that's still a downfall for him, but again, he wasn't taking no for an answer. Massive, massive resilience, and these are these are the stars of the game. And again, there's loads of them in your club. 
loads of them in, in every parish in the country and they don't have to be the ones that we're looking at on telly but these are just a, a few of the lads that, that I threw up there that, that showed that resilience uh, and the next one is our video okay so our next man is Stephen or Stephen Curry okay we'll throw on the video and we might just talk a little bit about him just bear with us now so we've, we've two minutes Okay, so <clears throat> again, there's one of the top, Steph Curry. Now again, I'm not a big into the basketball, but I, I just I, I saw this clip, and to me, it was brilliant. So he he was really good at his sport, you know. And sometimes you think, oh God, you, you you're good at an underage sport. Is that is it nearly a, a negative? But he he realised he was good at it, um, but used other sports to build that resilience because he felt that. He wasn't going to get challenged enough uh, because he was good at basketball um, and was given the opportunity by his parents to do that. Um, now, the only reason he, as he says himself, he didn't maybe continue was scheduling, so he had to decide. And, and the, the longer you go on, and, and obviously you want to get to the top, of your, the top of your game, it's very hard to do everything. Some lads can, can, can do a couple of sports at different times of the year, but... You know, so he used that to, to build that resilience. He, as I say, he became the, they reckon, um, he is the greatest shooter the game has ever seen. And that's some compliment to, to a basketball. He's the greatest. It's no, I don't think anyone has any more three-pointers than him. But you know, built resilience, obviously identified, obviously was given an opportunity, but built resilience outside of the game that came easy to him. And you can say that maybe being able to do that was he was he was very mature and um, to be able to do that so again you know a superstar of the game if you listen to him it's natural it was like cosmic dust descended on him and he just was good at basketball it wasn't it doesn't work that way um, no different than it didn't land on david clifford's door or it didn't you know it just didn't happen for henry shefflin or right keen so we built that resilience along the way uh, okay, so I suppose we were <clears throat> emphasize appropriate development, not early success. Okay, so we're looking at development all the time. So build a strong base through deliberate preparation. So again, different scenarios, challenging players all the time, taking them out of their comfort zone, and um, always emphasizing the fundamental skills, the technical skills of the game, and uh, robust, make players robust both physically and mentally. Uh, and the adaptable uh, players are adaptable. Challenge them, challenges, 
narrow skill base. These are the things that are going to challenge the resilience, narrow sports specific, specific uh, progress, and a win at all cost culture to develop for success. I think that's there are some of the messages that really hit home as we, as we went through the slides. So there's a lot of stuff in that, um, but I think that's that's the that's the big thing for for um, for you as coaches, for you as parents, and for you maybe as players. You're always going to be challenged. Find that challenge yourself. And, and if I could just tell the people or tell coaches or tell particularly players, it's be there. Whatever chance. And I see it. I see it every day. You know, oh, I didn't get the chance. He doesn't like me. I didn't get the opportunity. You know, I'm a firm believer if you knock on that door and often, often enough, it will, it will, um, it will open. Um, and I know again from my own point of view I had, I, I played one played two matches under 21 for Clare that was all I, I played in I was told always told too small too light and not fast enough um, and I'm not saying I read a book on resilience but I always had it that I was I, I always took my dad's advice was that be there and if they're really honest I just loved playing football and that probably was the one thing I always was easier to turn up um, and I was whether that was playing second team for Alan Wood whether it was playing under 16 B you know even in school I played under under 14 B under 16 B I just loved playing the game that was probably helped me build resilience along the way so no matter when I was told no I turn up because I love being there and I love kicking the ball around. Um, and I think that, that to me, was is the one thing you can always say, you say to, to, to players. Just be there. You, it won't always go the way you want it. Um, but, but always always be there and always, always give your give it your best when you are there. Um, the other thing, and I leave you with this one, and we might have a couple of questions on I know I'm going way over time. Uh, I normally talk too much. Anyone that knows me would probably say the same, uh, but it's something I, I and I didn't. I sent this. I I done up the clips, but I should have put it up at the end. But it's something I came across today. Actually, one of the guys that works with me said it to me, uh, and it's very very good. And you can take what you want from it. Uh, and I'm not sure who said it or where it came from, but it's just a quote: the "Same boiling water that softens the potato hardens the egg." It's about what you're made of, not the circumstances. And that's a fair. That's an, as I say, you can take what you want out of that. Um, but it takes the the same water that hardens, where that softens the potato, hardens the egg. So there you go. Um, listen, from my point of view, I say if there's any questions, you can throw them up. Um, thanks very much for listening to me. Um, it was a new experience for me. Uh, Colin said the time was going to fly by, and it did. Um, I hope you got something out of it. It's a wet, windy night outside, and it probably beats looking at Carnation Street, or um, maybe the kids have the telly taken over. So I, I'm, I was delighted to be here, and uh, as I say, I hope he's got something out of it. And as I say, any questions, throw them up there. And if not, um, just, just thanks for being part of it. Johnny, thank you very much for that. Um, I see there is a couple of less sightings, so we might have a question or two in a minute. Um, but if just while while that is happening, I just want to take this time to to thank Johnny for his uh, very enlightening discussion this evening. Um, and like anything we'd ask Johnny to do, it's he put some amount of time and effort and thought into it, and you can see that from, from the content that he provided. Um, I hope everybody took something from it. Uh, I suppose it's things like this. It's a constant thing about challenging, just challenging our thought process. And look at maybe our own behaviours, etc. So once again, Johnny, thank you very much for your contribution. I think looking at the lads' messages, there it's more thanks than, than questions. So um, I think we might leave it for tonight. If there is any questions, lads, you might email there. Um, you can send it across to us, and no doubt we, Johnny will, will come back to you. Um, so finally, I just want to thank you guys for for logging in. Um, again, as Johnny said, Monday night, but you've given your time and your your uh, engaging with us, which is great. Um, we have one final webinar coming up um, 
next month, which is Emmett Egan. I know I've just seen one or two Lazarus with us at the weekend. So Emmett Egan is going to be doing one on physical preparation, sort of pre-season, which will be more for adults, etc. Um, so sort of um, 18, 19, 20, 21 to up. Um, so that'll be um, that'll be on in the middle of December. Again, I'll communicate with each of you about it and I'll, I'll send that out. Um, I see there's a, there was a question there with slides. Yeah, we'll circulate the slides um, and we'll also have the video of it. We just, it just takes us a, a bit of time to, to download and process it, etc. So we'll share the video with everyone if you're if you're looking to um, to review some of the stuff that Johnny went through. So with that said, lads, I just want to thank each and every one of you and um, hopefully we'll we we'll talk to you again soon. And finally, Johnny, thank you very much for your for your no time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.